Hello, I hope you're doing well. Today we're going to discuss phylum, Echinodermata. This is one of my favorite phyla of organisms, my favorite group of inverts that live in the sea. So you may recognize this organism here in the picture. This is an ochre star. Learned a little bit about this when we studied the rocky intertidal. It's like the epic megafauna um, of the rocky intertidal zones. So people get really excited when they come across um, a sea star or a sea urchin in the rocky intertidal, which is another example of an echinoderm. So here's some examples of echinoderms. This is a sea urchin, a sea star, a basket star, and a sea cucumber. These are all examples of phylum echinodermata. So in terms of the classification scheme, the largest, most inclusive group is domain. These are in domain eukarya. They have eukaryotic cells, just like all of the inverts that we've studied do. They are in kingdom animalia, also like all the other invert phyla that we've studied this far. And then phylum echinodermata. This is our last invertebrate phylum uh, that lives in the ocean. So we'll move on to vertebrates uh, after we spring break. So, Phylum Echinodermata. Again, Echinodermata. Say it. Echinodermata. It is not a chino. It's Echinodermata. You can call them Echinoderms. So remember you have a note taker that you should be using to take notes that you can find on Google Classroom. So the first thing on the note taker is what is the literal translation of Echinoderm? So in Latin, Echino trans relates to spiny and derm skin. They have spiny skin. So it's really easy to imagine when you're thinking of something like a sea urchin uh, with spines all over the outside of them. Sea stars have smaller spines on the outside of them and feel rough. And something like a sea cucumber is going to have more microscopic spaced out spines. So they're not going to feel as rough. They might feel smooth and squishy, but they're still there. A characteristic that all echinoderms have in common is that they are all marine. This is not true of any other phyla that we've studied thus far. So if you think back to periphera, periphera or sponges, there's some in freshwater. Cnidarians are anemones and jellies. Uh, there's some in freshwater. Our mollusks, our shelled organisms, our arthropods, our jointed exoskeleton organisms, they all have examples on land, uh, in the ocean, and in freshwater. So this is exclusively marine, only found in salt water. Marine means salt. Let's talk about the symmetry of echinoderms using a sand dollar as an example. So a sand dollar is a type of echinoderm. So it would not be incorrect to say that echinoderms have bilateral symmetry. You can cut them into two pieces and they'd be the same on both sides. So that would not be incorrect. It also would not be incorrect to say that an echinoderm has radial symmetry. So if you think back to cnidarians, you have like a circle like a pie and you cut it in pieces. Uh, all the pieces are relatively the same. So they'd be uh, symmetrical. So that wouldn't be wrong either, but the most specific way to explain the symmetry of an echinoderm is that they have pentaradial symmetry. So you can cut them into five pieces of pie and they are all symmetrical. So they have penta for five radial symmetry. Easy if you imagine a sea star with five arms, one, two, three, four, five. You can cut that into five pieces. They're all symmetrical, pentaradial symmetry. What about something like a sea cucumber? I want you to imagine a banana and you're peeling back a banana and you have five pieces of peel that you're peeling back. So one, two, three, four, five. And that's like a sea cucumber. So all five of those pieces are equal. It's just kind of elongated out. So they also have pentaradial symmetry. There's always a couple of exceptions to the rule. So if you think of something like a sea star, there are a few that have a mutation and have four arms or six arms or seven. Um, but generally speaking, that species has five arms. Something like a sunflower star has many, many arms, and they're typically um, in 
multiples of five. So pentaradial symmetry in general for our echinoderms. They have three layers of tissue. So another characteristic that they all have in common. This was true uh, also in our mollusks, in our arthropods. If you recall back to our sponges, only had, um, they're or only organized at the cellular level, so they didn't even have tissue. We had two tissue layers in cnidarians, and now these ones have three, just like mollusks and arthropods. They're organized at the organ system level. They do not have a well-defined head. So if you look at the sea star, where's its head? I don't know. I don't see like eyes or eyes on stalks or appendages or antennae or anything like that. Sea cucumber, I don't know which end is what. Sea urchin, no, not easy to find anything either. So they don't really have a well-defined head. They of course have a mouth and they have an anus, so they have a complete digestive tract, but there's not like a well-defined head region um, in any examples of echinoderms, including sea stars, sea urchins, sand dollars, sea lilies, brittle stars, sea cucumbers, etc. No well-defined head. So let's move on um, by talking about the anatomy of echinoderms. We'll use sea star as our stand-in to discuss general anatomy of echinoderms. So here we have two views. Um, typically with organisms, we'll use like dorsal, ventral, um, on sea stars and echinoderms, we're instead going to use oral and aboral because, again, they don't have a well defined head. So, this view right here is what we're going to call aboral, opposite of oral. This is the surface without the mouth, so aboral. So, this one has the mouth right here in the middle and the underside. So, this is going to be the oral side of the sea star oral. So we call these arms, or another name for them is ray, like ray of sunshine, ray or arm. And in the dead center, they're going to have the anus. So this one's a little off. It's going to line up with the mouth. So this would make it the aboral surface because the anus is on this side. Central disc is this center region here where the arms and rays are attached. Uh, this is where a lot of the important internal organs are going to be. There is stuff in the arms, um, but if this is damaged, they're really in trouble. So we call this the central disc. Off center, we have something called a madreporite, which translates to mother, madre, por, porite, pores, uh, mother of all pores. So what this is is a large pore protected by shell calcium carbonate, and this is where they bring water into the body of the echinoderm. So madreporite water goes in. This is going to help them um, drive their tube feet, uh, transport nutrients, and all those things. So this is where water gets pumped in, the madreporite. So this is the oral surface. This is where the mouth is found, so oral surface, because the mouth is here in the center, lines up with the anus, separate opening and exit, so complete digestive tract. Here's the underside of our arms. Uh, they have spines on this side as well, so they're kind of protecting the delicate tube feet that we have in the middle. Another name for tube feet are podia. And they use these to cling on to things, to pry open shells, to move. So they use water pressure. They move in a hydraulic manner. So they suck water in through the madreporite. Then they can cling on to things with their two feet, also known as podia. Ambulacral groove, you can think of like kind of like a canyon. It's like a groove, a divot. Um, this is where the two feet are inside the ambulacral groove right here and then protected with spines around them. At the end of arms, they have um, these structures that look like longer, skinnier two feet right here. But these are actually sensory tentacles that typically sense uh, light and dark. Um, so helps them sense their environment. So that's generally the external anatomy of an echinoderm, specifically a sea star, but works for most species of uh, echinoderms as well. 
So a microscopic structure that you can find on some echinoderms, specifically sea stars and sea urchins, are pedicellaria. So these are little microscopic pinchers. So if you look right here, it's like a claw. There's one piece, there's another, and this can open and close. And you'll find these um, externally in between uh, the spines. And these are important structures for the sea star because they have important functions. So they can protect the sea star from small animals or larvae that might try to settle on their surface. Also externally, they have the tops of the tube feet known as dermal papula or ampullae, uh, which are their skin gills. So they need to keep those free so they can get oxygen from the water. So they want to keep debris, parasites, um, or any little larvae or anything that's trying to live on them off. So they use these pedicellaria to protect them from tiny things trying to settle on them and clog their skin gills. So those are pedicellaria, little pinchers. All right, now let's talk about the internal structure of an echinoderm. So one important system that they have, remember they're organized at the system level, is the water vascular system. This is really unique to phylum echinodermata and really important to um, their overall survival. So the water vascular system includes a series of canals that are filled with water. The water is brought into the body through the madreporite, the mother of all pores, like a sieve plate. Okay, so this is where the water is brought in, that madreporite, and then they have series of canals all inside of them, which lead to different places and transport the water around. This also helps them operate their tube feet, their podia, in a hydraulic manner so they can cling on to things and move about. So water vascular system is very important to echinoderms. So here is a diagram showing you the main parts of the water vascular system in an echinoderm. So you'll want to know these parts. So here we've talked about this one before. We saw it in the uh, aboral view of the sea star. This is the madreporite. So this is going to be sticking out externally off center on the central disc. This is what's going to pull water into the echinoderm. So this is where water enters the echinoderm. The canal in which the water travels inside the body is called a stone canal. And that's called the stone canal because it's protected with hard calcium carbonate on the outside. That then is going to lead to a ring canal which is shaped like a ring. So this is a ring shaped tube and it is connected to radial canals, which you can find going down the center of each ray or arm being the same thing. So this is gonna help water be transported all around the whole body of the sea star. So water comes in the madreporite, through the stone canal, to the ring canals, to the radial canals, which lead to each arm and ray. Then the tube feet are connected to that. The top of the tube feet are called ampullae or dermal papula is another name for them. So these are the skin gills. If you look at a sea star under a microscope, it looks like there's little balloons, little fuzzy balloons sticking out on the side of them. And those are the skin gills. So these are skin gills. And this is what the pedicellaria, the little pinchers are, um, making sure are free of debris and parasites, so skin gills. So these are going to stick out externally on the aboral surface, just like the madreporite. The bottom of these are the tube feet or the podia. So these are going to stick out uh, through the ambulacral groove of the oral side. And this is what they're gonna to use to cling on to things or hold on or kind of crawl around the seafloor or pry open shells. So these are the different parts of the water vascular system. Very important system in echinoderms and unique, very unique to phylum echinodermata. So what are the purposes of the water vascular system? So first off, 
The water vascular system has three major functions, three major purposes. One of those is locomotion. It helps uh, the echinoderm move around, crawl around, climb onto rocks, uh, hold onto surfaces. It also, another function is it helps them with feeding. So many sea stars, like the ochre star in the rocky intertidal zone, is a keystone species that's eating bivalves, mussels. Uh, so they're going to use those two those two feet to pry open the shells of the mussels. Then their stomach's going to come out externally, surround the food, and they're going to digest the uh, soft parts, the mantle and the visceral mass and all that of the mussel. So it's used to help them feed. Uh, they also can use the tube feet as gills. Um, so the top of the tube feet are gills, skin gills, but the bottom of the tube foot can also help with gas exchange, oxygen, and carbon dioxide. They have no heart. They have no blood vessels. So instead, they have this water vascular system. So this is how they transport nutrients, oxygen, carbon dioxide, cell wastes, etc., is by using this water vascular system. So they don't have blood cells, they don't have blood vessels. Instead, they have this water vascular system, no heart. They just pull in water through uh, the madreporite. So many functions um, of the water vascular system. In terms of cephalization, an echinoderm is not highly cephalized. They do not have a brain. They do not have ganglia. Um, so they, they're they very sluggish animals is typically what they're referred to as. It doesn't mean they can't sense and respond to their environment as well at all because they have things like little uh, sensory tentacles on the tips of arms and rays of sea stars. But generally, overall speaking, they are not highly cephalized. They do not have a centralized brain. Um, so they respond a little slower to their environment than a more cephalized organism like a lobster or an arthropod. They do have an internal skeleton composed of calcium carbonate plates, so calcium carbonate like the shells of mollusks are made of. These plates might fuse together to form um, a rigid section, which we would call a test. So if you've ever been walking on the beach and you found the shell of a sand dollar, that's actually called a test, or the little globe shell of an urchin, that's actually called a test. So that's calcium carbonate plates um, fused together. They're not always fused together, so they're not fused together um, in something like a sea cucumber. They're spread out and more microscopic. In something like a brittle star, they could have connective tissue between them, making them flexible. So these calcium carbonate plates in a brittle star look similar to our vertebrae, and it helps their arms be wiggly and flexible. Let's talk a little bit about how echinoderms digest. So in a sea star, they actually invert one of their stomachs out of their mouth. So if you think about them eating a mussel, it's kind of big for a flat sea star. So they're going to actually evert, push out one of their stomachs, their cardiac stomach out of their mouth, surround it around the soft food, spew out digestive enzymes until it's a sloshy soup, and then pull that stomach back in and finish the digestion. So this isn't something like a sea star. In a sea urchin, they're not gonna do something like that. They have five little white teeth on the underside of them to munch on things. They're gonna pull their food in internally and their intestine is gonna do most of the work. There's a lot of surface area for digestive gland in echinoderms. So you'll find this feathery, flowery-like pattern in the arm um, or ray of each sea star where they have digestive gland. So that's helping make all the enzymes for digestion. Then the undigested material will leave out the anus because they have a complete digestive tract.
In terms of respiration, they have lots of surface area with their water vascular system to help them with that. So they have thousands of skin gills, those dermal papillae or ampullae, um, all sticking outside on the surface of them. They'll have a urchin or a sea star will have pedicillaria. Those little microscopic pinchers to help them keep them free of debris and parasites. Besides skin gills, sea urchins, sea stars, and other echinoderms can also use their two feet, also known as podia, um, because those are interacting with the water around them as well. So they can do gas exchange through their two feet or their podia as well. In terms of reproduction, the echinoderms uh, reproduce externally. So typically they'll use broadcast spawning. So they'll shed their egg and the sperm into the water. And many of it, because but chances are not all of them are going to meet up and become a fertilized egg. So they'll shed many egg and sperm out into the water. They are found in separate sexes. So they're dioecious, means two dioecious, two houses. So separate houses for males and females. So they'll only make one type of gametes. They're not typically hermaphrodites like we've seen in some other groups. This is an example of one of the stages of development um, in a echinoderm. So there's a planktonic larvae, so they'll be part of meroplankton, um, and then they'll settle later into sea star, sea cucumber, sea urchin, etc. They can also reproduce asexually by fission, so in sea stars they can literally split in two. Um, some sea stars can also regenerate. So if a gull or some type of seabird is lurking around the rocky inner tidal and takes a bite, eats the arm, or ray, same thing, off one of the sea stars, they actually can grow that arm back. Typically, if the central disc area is damaged, though, they're in more trouble and probably not going to survive. So here's a picture of one sea star where... <laughs> almost all of the arms um, were bitten off and those will regenerate and there's just one arm, regular sized arm left, but it's gonna be okay because the central disc uh, is still intact. All right, we're gonna move on to filling out the table on the different classes of echinoderms. So there's five classes. So we're in domain, eukarya, kingdom, animalia, phylum, echinodermata, and we branch them into five classes. So you have a table to fill out on these five classes. So the first class that we'll talk about um, is the most well-known, uh, Asteroidia. Easy to remember, space, stars, asteroid space, Asteroidia is our sea stars. So these are going to typically eat bivalves, some snails and chitons. They like to eat mollusks. Here, this is a picture of a sunflower star that lives off in Monterey Bay, so it has many arms. You'll notice that the surface of it looks a little fuzzy. That little, Those little fuzzy parts that you see are actually their dermal papilla, their skin gills. So it's actively breathing, respiring right now. This little uh, white dot right here is its madreporate, where it's sucking in water. So that's a sunflower star, a cool example of an asteroid. So in this class, there's about 1,600 known species. They're voracious predators. They're going after mussels and things like that. They're typically keystone species, um, like in the Rocky Intertidal with the ochre star. They have that star-shaped body with a central disc. They can regenerate those rays if their central disc is not damaged. Something unique to this class is the ambulacral groove where the two feet are found on the aboral surface, the pedicillaria, the little pinchers that are keeping those skin gills free of debris so they can breathe. So here's just some more examples of class Asteroidia. Bat stars that live here in Monterey Bay, they kind of have these webbing in between their arms. They can have modeling kind of patterns and they come in different colors. You can find them um, to have four, five, six, or even seven rays, but five is most common. So those are bat stars. This is the infamous ochre star found in the Rocky Intertidal, keeping the muscle populations in check. So they kind of have this um, unique little pattern here around their central disc. So this is an ochre star. 
It says a giant spine star or jewel top star with little blue coloration around their spines. And this is one of my favorite species of sea stars. This is a leather star. This one actually feels soft and smooth like leather. Its spines um, are shorter. There's its madreporite that's real obvious. Um, and this species actually uh, emits an odor that smells similar to garlic, but like bad stinky garlic. And so um, this is kind of a deterrent for something like a sea otter that might want to eat them. It emits this bad smell and then it kind of drops it and gets away from predators that way. Here's some other examples of some sea stars. This one, you can see the madreporite real obviously as well. So that's where the water is brought in for the water vascular system. Okay, next class is a mouthful to pronounce. Ophiroidea are brittle stars. So are, are serpent stars and basket stars. So these are like weird stars, um, not the typical sea stars uh, that we think of. So differently shaped um, stars. So this is a brittle star. That look, the arms look a lot like uh, worms, <laughs> and these have those calcium carbonate plates lined up kind of like our vertebrae, so they're flexible. So, really obvious central disc and has these arms um, along them, so it's set up a little bit different than an Asteroidea sea star. Some of these brittle stars can be planktonic as well or found in the deep sea. Um, sometimes they can be hidden really well, like in holdfasts of kelp. So here are some characteristics of class Ophiroidea. There's a lot of species, about 2,000 species. They have five equal rays that look like worms, these wiggly arms that look like worms. Um, they can also regenerate these arms um, as long as their central disc is intact. As a matter of fact, when they feel threatened by a predator, um, an escape tactic they might use is they might drop an arm. Um, in hopes that the predator will go after the arm while they wriggle away and then slowly over time regenerate that arm back. So that's called autotomize. Some species are small enough that they don't really need a madreporite, so they're going to lack that madreporite. Uh, they can just use simple diffusion uh, to bring water in. Many of them are fil filter feeders or scavengers, so feeding on marine snow or any little dead bits um, that are around them, some detritus. Here's an example of a brittle star, more brittle stars. There's a planktonic brittle star. This is a basket star, so they have these arms with like tendrils all around them. So they're pretty cool looking. Basket star. And then we're moving on to our next class, Echinoidea. This includes sea urchins and sand dollars. We divide this class into regular and irregular. So a regular echinoid is going to be globe shaped and an irregular echinoid is going to be more flattened. So sea urchins have a very uh, special structure that's well known called Aristotle's lantern. So you're going to want to know what that is. And it's this big, gigantic mouth part with five little teeth in a circle that it uses to munch on kelp or whatever it's eating. Some sea urchins are more predator, predatory as well. There's about 950 species of echinoids. Their ossicles, so those are the calcium carbonate piece, pieces, overlap and can be fused together into a test, a shell. So when we find a sea urchin shell or sand dollar shell, it's called a test. Not a quiz, but a test. So the regular ones are globe-shaped. Irregular ones are flattened. So urchins are regular. Sand dollars are irregular. Aristotle's lantern, that structure with the five little white teeth, um, is found in our regular ones, our urchins. They also have pedicillaria like our sea stars to help keep their two feet and whatnot uh, free of debris. Many people eat um, sea urchin eggs uh, in sushi, so that could be called roe or uni. So maybe some of you have eaten that before. And some species of sea urchin can have poison in their spines or in their pedicillaria. So be careful, don't step on them, leave them alone, um, unless you're with someone specifically and you know. 
So here's the inside of a test of an urchin that has been cleaned out. So normally we'd see a lot of um, digestive structures and lots and lots and lots of gamete um, inside the sea urchin. So all that's been cleaned out and we can see the top of the Aristotle's lantern here. And on the underside, we're going to have five white teeth. So really, really big, powerful structure, lots of surface area for attachment um, of muscles. And it's going to be a powerful feeding structure um, for those regular echinoids, those sea urchins. So here's a sea urchin, another urchin. Here's a pencil urchin. Here's a sand dollar. So this is the test of a sand dollar. Um, the sandal is dead. All of its spines and two feet and all that have fallen off and been decomposed. This is what a sandal actually looks like when it's alive. So typically most of them are purple. They have purple spines and they have tube feet and they'll kind of arrange themselves at an angle um, in the sand and feed on things that are falling down. So this is what a live sandal would look like. That's an irregular echinoid. Um, here's a quick video clip I'd like to show you of an army of sea urchins. All right, we had some great, oops, sorry. We had, <laughs> sorry, got something in the way. We had some great examples of uh, echinoderms in that video. So a lot of representation there. We saw um, our sea urchins mowing down those kelp forests. So we've learned how they're keystone species as well. We need the sea otters to keep them in check so they're not mowing down kelp forests, creating urchin barrens. We saw some brittle stars, which are Ophiroidians. We saw some sea stars, like the sunflower star, which are true sea stars, asteroids. Um, and then they were eating some irregular echinoids, the sand dollars. So good representation there. I already have two more classes to talk about. Next one is even more of a mouthful, and this is holothuroidea, which includes our sea cucumbers, which are typically detritivores eating detritus, dead bits of stuff, organic particles out of the sand. So some people think of them like kind of like vacuum cleaners um, from the sand. So holothuroidea. I remember their name because some of them can actually eviscerate their digestive tract to get away from predators. So basically they're hurling up their guts. So holothuroidea kind of sounds like hurling. So that's how I remember it, the name of the class. Um, um, so they have pentaradial symmetry um, as well. Here's their stone canal when they're madreporite with their water vascular system where they're bringing in the water. They'll have rows of tube feet, um, microscopic calcium carbonate ossicles. You're not going to find like a test from a sea cucumber because those little shell bits are little fragments um, spread throughout. They have these feeding tentacles that can come out of their mouth and catch food, and they can um, bring them in internally as well. And they have an interesting structure. They have a respiratory tree that comes out their cloaca, like their anus. So they kind of breathe with their rear end. Um, so they're, they're really unique. <laughs> uh, we have about 1200 species. Uh, they also have a calcareous ring. So they're really soft. Um, so they have this like calcareous ring, calcium carbonate ring that's around their pharynx so near their mouth for muscle attachment because there's not many hard parts um, in a sea cucumber. So again, those shell parts, those ossicles are microscopic spread out. Madripoorite is internal. They have those feeding tentacles, oral tentacles that come out of their mouth, a respiratory tree around their anus, also called a cloaca, so it's called cloacal breathing. And cool thing they do is evisceration. So they eviscerate um, when they're threatened, so they spew out their digestive tract. Um, they can regenerate that back. Um, so then they'll crawl away to get away from a predator. So it's kind of like, you know, like an ink cloud um, or a bioluminous cloud from that shrimp and octopuses that we've talked about before. So just like a decoy to get away um, from a predator. Some have toxins in them, just like some urchins have toxins um, in their spines. So you want to be careful with that and not play with cucumbers if you don't know much about them. Okay, and a few forms of them are planktonic, so they will remain plankton their whole life. So they'll be holoplankton.
So here's some pictures of a sea cucumber. Here's one that lives in Monterey Bay, common in Monterey Bay. Another sea urchin here. Here's the um, feeding tentacles, oral tentacles. So we're looking just at a mouth view of a sea cucumber. We got a sea star there in the background. So sea cucumber in feeding position. And then here's a cool video clip on how sea cucumbers breathe. So very unique. Sea cucumbers are very, very unique. Okay, um, last class that we're going to talk about today is Crinoidea. So we know the least about this class uh, because most of these are found in the deep sea. So Crinoidea include feather stars. They're filter feeders. They're gonna digest any organic particles that stick to these feathery arms that they have. So they look a lot like a lot of other things. So kind of hard to distinguish, probably another reason why we don't know so much about them. Um, they have ciliary action that they use, uh, like little projections to pass these food, this food down to their uh, mouth. So there's about 700 species, probably more, um, least understood, found in the deep sea, resemble a lot of other organisms, so maybe a little more difficult to identify. They'll collect food with two feet, so they have those two feet in the podia, like all the other echinoderms that we've talked about. And most of them are found in the deep sea. So they're just hanging around, they're passive suspension, just feeding on things that are falling down to them. They're basically feathery arms upon a stalk. So that is Crinoidea. And these are echinoderms, really cool phyla of organisms that are exclusively marine. 
So I hope you finish your note taker. Make sure you turn that into Google Classroom and we'll study Echinoderms a bit more. Have a great day. Thank you.